I know who I am. I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude. Sound about right. Hello, and welcome to Retro Project. My name's Rod, I'm an animator by trade, and I love old tech. Today, I want to take you through the process of animating a 3D character on a 1987 Amiga 2000 computer and Lightwave 3D. We're going to start off by looking at the hardware, then take a look at the software and the animation process, before finally looking at the result. Anyway, without wasting more time, let's get to it! Okay. So this is my Amiga 2000. This machine was originally released in 1987, and stock it had a 7 MHz Motorola 68000 CPU and 1 MB of RAM. This particular machine came with a SCSI card with a 40 MB hard drive and 2 MB of fast RAM installed. I acquired this machine secondhand around 1994, by which time it was already pretty out of date. But nonetheless, this is the machine that gave me my start in 3D, and I've never looked back. Now before I could start this whole project, this machine required a fair amount of work to get up and running again after many years in storage. The clock battery, which you can see at the bottom of the screen, had leaked acid onto the motherboard, so the first order of business was to remove it, clean up the mess, and repair the CPU socket, which had sustained acid damage. More recently, a replacement battery has been installed, and a couple of RAM chips on the motherboard had also gone bad, and they've been replaced too. An extra 6 megabytes of fast RAM was added to the SCSI card, bringing it up to 8 megabytes, as well as this Neuroth CPU card, which has a 14 MHz 68020 CPU, and a 40 MHz 6 882 floating point unit, which is overclocked. To 50 megahertz, hence the heatsink. The card also has 4 megabytes of 32-bit memory, bringing the total system memory up to 13 megabytes. In the video slot, there is a NewTek Video Toaster, which is a card designed to do real-time video effects, switching between multiple analog video sources. It synchronizes the video signal, which required me to change the jumper settings and the crystal to change this machine from PAL frequency to NTSC. Now, you can see this little black card here. This is an Apollo Vampire V500. This is a brand new upgrade card that gives the machine a pretty epic boost to the equivalent of 100 MHz plus CPU and 128 MB of memory. And as you can also see, we're using a compact flash card in place of a hard disk. Doing 3D at 14 MHz is possible, but it's pretty rough going, and that little bit of modern tech makes the machine absolutely fly. Okay, so we boot the software through the Video Toaster switcher interface, and here is Lightwave 3D. For reference, here's the character we're making, and here is the animation. I know who I am! I'm a dude playing a dude disguised as another dude! Sound about right. I'll let it loop a second time so you can see it without the sound. Just jumping into screen capture now, and now into modeler, the part of Lightwave that obviously makes models. Just to give you a super quick tour, I'm going to load in the pre-made object. As we load objects, you'll see I'm loading separate components, and I'm loading them into different layers. This is a handy way for us to view meshes together, but keep them as separate objects, so we can bring them into Lightwave and rig and animate them individually. This is all pre-OpenGL, so one nifty feature that's unique to Lightwave as far as I know is the rotating perspective view. Which is actually kind of handy, since it's not quite fast enough for you to tumble the viewport the way you would now, just to keep checking your shape as you model. So we'll clear all that, and we'll start modeling. Now we load in our backdrop image. We'll start by making a box. Naturally, we now want to extrude a face to start creating our shape. I'm using the menus as much as possible here so you can see what's happening, but most commands have keyboard shortcuts, which makes it a little less tedious than it appears. 
That's basically it though. The more powerful tools we're used to aren't there. But between extrude and cut, you can make pretty much any mesh you please. And innate glorious colours too. Okay, now I had a few people say they were interested in knowing just how you synchronise with the sound. Now, normally you can just bring a waveform into your 3D software these days and you synchronise it up as simple as that. Um, unfortunately, Lightwave doesn't have that feature, so we have had to go old school. And we have had to create what I am showing you now, which is called an exposure sheet. Now, this, as you can see, has the sound waveform down the side of the page, and if it's a bit too blurry here, but it's got the, the frame numbers printed from top to bottom as well. And then you can see that I have sketched in the syllables of all the words next to those waveforms, so I know what sound falls on what frame. And then next to that, um, you can see I'm, I'm doing thumbnails of exactly what expressions I want my characters to have. And I simply duplicate those expressions in Lightwave um, using the rig. And I put them at the necessary frame. We're loading up Lightwave layout module again. And I'm going to load in out my head object. Yeah. Pretty tricky. Um, your options for how you can skin an object are very limited. So what you end up doing is you morph the, create the object you want, and then you create a really weird distorted version of it that's kind of separated um, with the points trans translated away from each other so you can assign them to bones easily and then you can use the bones to translate the object back into shape. One of the hardest things about this layout module is you can't get a solid polygon view, you can only get wireframe views. And so you actually have to do sort of little low spec renders to be able to see the, the surface of the object. And now you see we're, we're actually doing a, a ray trace render with all the shadows and it's pretty jolly slow. Now the interface itself only runs in, in four or eight colors and so it's, it's just giving us this work in progress render again in seven shades of gray. And once it f completes the render, it's going to display it in hold and modify mode, which you'll notice it gives these funny colored fringes. Um, that's just an artifact of the, the way it's trying to display the color because it can't actually display straight up 4,000 colors. This is a, a chipset originally designed in 1983. And there he is. So yeah, you can actually take the, the techniques that we use today and, you know, apply them retrospectively and, and make it work. Thanks for sticking with my video all the way to the end. I hope you enjoyed it, and if all goes according to plan, we'll do a couple more of these. Taking this current character through to a fully animated scene, as well as looking at some other retro 3D packages. Happy animating!